Welcome to the first Cultures of the Future lecture promoted by Setups. Setups is a center for English translation and Anglo-Portuguese studies hosted by the Faculty of Arts and Humanities of the University of Porto and by the Faculty of Social and Human Sciences of the Nova University of Lisbon. Setups is a dynamic research center that brings together more than 100 senior and junior researchers with the common purpose of promoting scholarly work and activities with high national and international reach. Cultures of the Future Lectures is Setup's latest initiative which aims to provide innovative tools and methods by inviting prominent scholars from all over the world to reflect on relevant topics to our fields of research. For our first lecture, I am honored to introduce Jennifer Wagner Lawler, Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and English at Pennsylvania State University. Wagner Lawler has published two monographs, Postmodern Utopias and Feminist Fictions, and edited two essay collections, including The Scandal of Susan Sontag. She is the author of dozens of book chapters and articles in Utopian Studies, Feminist Studies and Contemporary Women's Writing, and a former president of the Society for Utopian Studies. Her current work looks at the cultural significance of plastic and plastic waste and its impacts on environmental crisis. She has published several articles on plastetics, a term that incorporates the study of plasticity as a trope and the hermeneutics of plastic artifacts in literary and artistic texts. With Fatima Vieira and Peter Marx, she co-edited the recently published Palgrave Handbook of Utopian and Dystopian Literatures, to which she also contributed with nothing less than two chapters, Narrative and Home. Moving from Utopian narratives and gender spaces, we are privileged for having Jennifer Wagner Lawler inaugurating Setup's Cultures of the Future sessions with a three-part lecture on the force of gender. Queer Reckonings in Post-War American Utopian Literature is the first part of this series. Thank you and welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, CTOPS for, for having me here today um, for this series of three lectures entitled uh, The Force of Gender. Uh, and I'd especially like to, uh, to thank Fatima and uh, also her graduate students, Manuel and Joanna, who have so wonderfully taken care of me and uh, driven me around. Um, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful visit so far. So uh, this first lecture, um, The Force of Nature, uh, with the subtitle Queer Reckonings in Post-War American Utopian Literature, uh, opens with two quotations. The first is from Gloria Steinem from 2008. And the second one actually is a response to Steinem by uh, Ruth Marcus, who's a, um, a uh, editorial um, writer for the Washington Post, um, also a college colleague of mine. So it's nice to see that. Um, and also I'll read the two quotations. Quote, gender is probably the most restricting force in American life, whether the question is who must be in the kitchen or who could be in the White House, end quote. And the second uh, by Luke Marcus, appeared a few weeks later, quote, gender isn't the most restricting force in American life. It remains a force to be reckoned with, end quote. So in a, a January 2008 New York Times op-ed, Gloria Steinem flags, once again, the essentialist work of sexism uh, in American life. Her focus is on gender types of work, the essentialist domestic work of the kitchen in the privacy of the American home that, quote unquote, must be done by women versus the aspirational reach of the male uh, American workforce or the possibility of public facing work, leadership work, of the one who, who is in the White House. Two months later, Washington Post commentator Ruth Marcus reminds us, uh, or responds rather, with a correction. 
not because she thinks that Steinem is wrong exactly, uh, but because she wants to remind us of where Steinem's own celebrity in American life comes from, the force of resistance against uh, the enforcement of an increasingly outmoded gender regime. Barkas's op-ed title, The Force of Gender, promises a reckoning, an accounting of and for that demands a response. The force of gender is oppressive and oppositional, formative and destructive, a force field inherently unstable in excess of forms of restriction. Gender's excessiveness inheres in its plasticity. Thus, it will remain, quote, a force of reckoning, end quote, so long as American life enforces a binaristic conception of it, so long as the one, male, is defined as the dispositive of the negative other, female. What Eve Kozofsky Sedgwick calls the conceptual privilege of heterosexism is certainly a through line in this lecture series, Look at Gender Worlds in American Postwar Utopian Literature. But a double bind must also be acknowledged. The force of race, uh, too, is to be reckoned with. In early 2008, America is in the midst of a presidential campaign, quote unquote, democracy at work, preceded by a democratic primary that pitched uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton against one another. Neither Steinem nor Marcus say anything about race being at least as restricting as gender in American life. But the question at that time was being floated, who would, American, who would the American electorate be more likely to choose, a black man or a white woman? This is a concise expression of this nation's most intransigent double bind, American democracy as essentially, pun intended, racist as it is gendered. The inseparability of gender and race injustice stands in the way of any American utopia in which liberty and justice for all is even a possibility. As uh, Bell Hooks observes, quote, feminist revolution alone, unquote, is insufficient to, quote, a vision of mutuality that would be the basis for a new ethos to support peace and possibility. And here's the, a longer quote from Hooks. Feminist re revolution alone will not create such a world. It we need to end racism, class elitism, imperialism. But it will make it possible for us to be fully actualized females and males able to create beloved community, to live together, realizing our dreams of freedom and justice, living the truth that we are all created equal. An inspiring utopian vision, but a version of things that leaves the logics and historical violence of gender binarism in place. This chapter argues that the gendered worlds of post-war utopian and dystopian literature offered by scenarios of gender reckoning in speculative and utopian fiction seem to have placed us today at the limits of feminism. A recent cluster of novels explicitly indebted to Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale from 1985 is symptomatic of the stalemate. The same story, more or less, is getting told over and over again, and I'll be talking more about this cluster of novels in, in the second lecture. The stalemate is a failure of imagination, a reluctance to think past gender as we know it, or past gender altogether. Um, these are the texts I will be most interested in, these ones with a queer vision rather than a uh, what we have come to think of as a, a feminist vision. While so many fictional gendered worlds are responding to ongoing challenges to women's auto autonomy to the extent that women have it, uh, much less can keep it, others extend their vision before slash below slash beyond constructions of binary gender. I'll be clear, to forget the queering work of, utopian, of the utopian imaginary is to hamstring the real work of utopian critique. As British author China Mieville observes, quote, if we take utopia seriously as a total reshaping, its scale means that we can't think it from this side. It's the process of making it that will allow us to do so. It is utopian fidelity that might underpin our refusal to expand it, 
uh, to, or our refusal to expand uh, it or any roadmap. We should utopia, he concludes, as hard as we can. Resistance, Mieville adds, succeeds, quote, only by refusing that system's logic, which the system itself cannot, of course, do, end quote. His notion of a utopian imperative is, quote, embracing our not-togetherness. Our aim, he says, an aspect of our utopianism should be this strategy of tension, end quote. This strategy of tension, utopia's kernel of critique, and the basis of its own narrative plasticity informs my approach to thinking gender as, quote, a force to be reckoned with uh, in post-war American literature. The harder Marxian vision of Mieville is likely more tuned to not the earlier bell hooks that I read from earlier, but the bell hooks of Killing Rage of 2004, analyzing the underside, as it were, of Hooks's own hope for a self-actualization of males and females in American life. Mieville, to this day, uh, will argue that we must embrace our non-togetherness rather than entertain fantasies, much less a hope of communal harmony. Binary gendered worlds in post-war American utopian literature are never peaceful worlds. With contemporary theorizations of gender fluidity or plasticity, though, the queer work of utopia represents itself in faithful resistance to the functional logics of sex, gender, and race. If gender is, quote unquote, a force to be reckoned with, it is not only because gender remains one of the most intransigent barriers to a self-actualization of America's uh, utopian vision of mutuality. It's also because the categories of sex, gender, and race undergirding America's neoliberal imperative powerfully contradict that vision. We must utopian ha utopia hard, warns Mieville, because the powers that be are working harder than we can imagine to reinforce the myths of the everyday or the natural, the normal. We must uh, do more than claw our way into repressive structures, um, says uh, American critic Maggie Nelson, emphasizing the critical function of, uh, or the critical function that utopia work takes on as a practical technology. The force of critical intelligence is a practice that, above all, must resist utopian visions that only reinforce our enthrallment to social, uh, dominant social mythologies. To utopia hard in America means the hard work of critique and reckoning, including self-reckoning, with the entangled forces of gender and race within American biopolitics, even in the absence of an alternative. This uh, section of, of the lecture is entitled Alien Intelligence and Feminist Modernity. By the 1950s, there already existed a tradition of women's speculative writing tapping into the generic possibilities and thematics of predominantly male-authored utopian and science fiction. Carol Farley Kessler's important anthology, Daring to Dream, Utopian Fiction by United States Women Before 1950, um, indexes many of the themes recognizable to this day in gendered worlds of contemporary speculative fiction. Some of those themes uh, are the, the disruption of gender role expectations, resistance to male control over, uh, and the narrow prescription of women's labor, women's financial independence, the possibilities of technology, a drive for self-autonomy. Kessler describes these texts' critical look at what she calls the defeating circularity, or what uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, author of A Women's Utopia, short story from 1907, and of course later, Herland, describes as a mutually enforcing narrowing, quote unquote, of women by men and men by women. Many of these early texts in the anthology appropriate generic utopian tropes, especially the dream vision, imagining a future time when a liberated womanhood 
allows for unprecedented social evolution. Kessler acknowledges, though, that these women's goals, that is the women writers, are for the most part, quote, not separation, but communication, end quote. Many of the writers seek efficiencies offered by contemporary science and technology to the extent that such technologies can, and this is a quote from Gilman, can provide time and thoughts lost to a woman who would, quote, extend herself, end quote, in other ways than the domestic and particularly reproductive labor. What Gilman calls, quote, extended self, a family, end quote, is not, however, deeply challenged. Women remain the moral anchor of good housekeeping, even as they claim a place in a remodeled American homeland. The final piece in Kessler's anthology, however, Gertrude Short's long short story, A Visitor from Venus from 1949, stands as a notable transition piece into post-World War II gender speculation. Published only a few years after World War II, the story features a female transport aviator named Roberta, forced by a snowstorm to make an emergency landing at unknown coordinates, although she thinks that she's at the near the border of the United States and Canada, um, which seems appropriate now. A nearly, uh, sorry, a nearby cabin provides shelter, including an unusual TV uh, radio device that uh, she's never seen before that is broadcasting a, quote, picture play in color, end quote, featuring two figures on screen. Neither the voices nor the bodies of these figures are identified, uh, identifiable as male or female, and Roberta thinks to herself, quote, they, they seem to have reached that age when sex is not a division between them, end quote. And Roberta gathers, finally, that she's overhearing a report on a, quote, mission of goodwill and planetary neighborliness, end quote, by an ambassador from the planet Venus to the planet Earth. So this uh, ambassador has just returned from visiting Earth and is now reporting back to their, um, their, their boss. <laughs> the report speaker, Zua, details the failed state of Earth's governments, including democratic ones, and of humanity, whose standard of moral values was debased in an inverse proportion to their material achievements. Zua decries the admiration of strong governmental authorities, attributing the idea in large part to sexual difference. Man is the boss, and women, or woe man, um, a kind of false etymology, woe man, is a, a secondary creature, the bossed, end quote. Expected, quote, only to bring forth Adam's sons, Zua judges the Eves as being, quote, held in slavery as a sex creature who must, quote, awaken to her right and take these things in charge, unquote. Zua has been reading the Bible, among other things, so that's how she's come up with these names, um, Adam and the Eves. So Zua elaborates on humans' binary sex gender system. Quote, we, that is, Venusites, would call them father forms and mother forms, for it is only in form and not in mind that we recognize a difference, end quote. Embodied gender identity, as such, does not exist on Venus. From their perspective, Earth's diseased, warring civilization stems from a set of crude binaries of sex and of race, and they particularly focus on the discursive nature of gender and race identification. This penchant to hierarchize um, among humans is evidence of, quote, a strange and confused planet, they say, with an immature level of civilization, which is also evidenced in humanity's use of technology in, quote, the most unintelligent possible way for war. Wars are without intelligence, Zua observes, uh, and wars uh, express a merely brutish drive toward destructive mastery. The antidote to this kind of um, species toxicity will be, Zua predict, uh, predicts, the Eves, caretakers, not destroyers, who, quote, must help keep the peace they make, or Adam will explode the earth 
out of the universe, end quote. Uh, once attending only to, quote, her child and home, unquote, Eve is, quote, beginning to think in terms of the worldwide homes, end quote, and repudiating, repudiating technologies of power and slash as warfare. Not all technology uh, in the story is negative, um, only on Earth. Zua's own, own spacecraft is invisible, thus not, non intimidating to the alien worlds that, um, that they approach. And technology on Venus promotes relationality through travel, observation, critique, and communication, never for what Donna Haraway called the reproductive apparatuses of war. End quote. Indeed, Venus achieves Donna Haraway's contemporary vision of, quote, swerving around a death-defying and death-worshipping culture bent on total war in order to remember in material sem semiotic reality the fragile, mortal, and juicy things we really are, end quote. Haraway echoes Zua's wish that human that humans begin, quote, remolding or remodeling kinlings to make a kinder and unfamiliar world, end quote. And in fact, Zua offers what Veronica Hollinger might call a queer rereading of human history. Uh, their report is a, a god's eye reckoning of war-torn Earth, but the god's eye is Venus's and not Mars's. And, uh, and, um, leaves the reforming of human civilization to a quote-unquote free agent deemed most likely to be either female or non-white. There's a pretty big discussion of race uh, in the story. Um, the Venusites understand that any initiative must be the existential choice to reject unfreedom, as uh, de Beauvoir put it in the same year, 1949. That rejection takes what Venusites call intelligence, a mature and critical sensibility resisting the logics of any form of hierarchical privilege or of domination. Uh, this section is entitled, There Can Be an Elsewhere, Queer Speculations. The force of gender as a colonizing apparatus is central to the work of Ursula uh, K. Le Guin and Samuel R. Delaney whose many speculative and science fiction classics also explore, um, as Gertrude Short does not, the anticipation, I'm sorry, the emancipation, well, maybe both, <laughs> emancipation uh, of sexual desire. Le Guin's incomparable The Left Hand of Darkness from 1969 began as a thought experiment. Um, I, I eliminated, says Le Guin, gender, I eliminated gender, to find out what was left. What is left is a world nowhere near as placid as Short's Venus, but not so far from it as ours is either. Genli I is a human envoy to the planet Gethen, whose native inhabitants are actually neither female nor male, but both. All mature Gethenians come into a cyclical camera or estrus as either male or female, without consciousness of a human notion of difference. Genli only slowly comes to understand how ambisexuality might matter. There is, for one thing, no mass warfare, though plenty of political machination. There's no rape, no, quote, psychosexual relationship to his mother or father, end quote. And, um, but because of Gethanite's unfamiliar difference to him, I misunderstands and distrusts a would-be ally, former Karhide Prime Minister Estraban. Named as a traitor and exiled, Estraban goes uh, with Genli Ai, um, traveling three months over a vast, horizonless, and unclaimed ice field, the Gobreen ice field. Um, a trip that it actually only Genli survives. But being wholly dependent for the most part uh, on Estraven, Genli finally sees and admits his own cultural prejudices. Quote, 
And I saw then again, and for good, what I had always been afraid to see uh, and had pretended not to see in him, uh, that he was a woman as well as a man. And until then, I had rejected him, refused his own reality. What I was left was, with was, at last, acceptance of him as he was." End quote. Throughout her long career, Le Guin touched on the ideological structuralizations of race and gender, both in her fiction and in many public essays, um, and often uh, in acerbic remarks uh, on, quote, a self-contented, exclusively male sense of privilege among science fiction writers. The Left Hand of Darkness explicitly proposes dismantling the foundational fictions of gender dualism. Quote, there is no division of humanity into strong and weak halves, protective and unprotected, dominant, submissive, owner, chattel, active, passive. In fact, the whole tendency to dualism that pervades human thinking might be, may be found to be lessened or changed on winter. So this is the, um, uh, the planet that's been visited and this is that quotation was from Genli I, um, writing on his experience there. Critics have named the bleak, ambiguous space of the planet's two continu contiguous ice fields, that would be the Gobrin ice sheet and winter, um, as uh, a definitively queer space, a depopulated landscape without a culture, without visible boundaries, and almost literally blindingly white, uh, a color, of course, comprised of all colors, undifferentiated. And thus the essential backdrop for stripping, the stripping away of Genli's own cultural limitations. Quote, up here on the ice, each of us is singular, isolate. I, as cut off from those like me, from my society and its rules, as he from his. Such scenes epitomize Le Guin's talent for stripping her characters down to the barest possible life and, quote, opening the door to imagination and the possibility of things being other than they are, end quote. Sex and se sexuality, says Le Guin, offers, or offer, quote, a tremendous playground, and it doesn't do any harm to have people's ideas shook up, end quote. Readers seeking simple answers about good and evil, Le Guin considers immature in their minds. And while less overt about her interest in race, the author says the same, that is about immaturity, of publishers and some readers discomfort with characters of color. And actually she objected to uh, publishers tendencies to make her characters um, of color uh, white on the covers. Uh, and she finally eventually won that battle, but it took like literally years. Le Guin's contemporary, Samuel R. Delaney, plays on a similar playground, but attends far more frequently, deliberately, and provocatively to the entanglements of race and gender. Like Le Guin, Delaney remarks that, quote, us and them fiction of any sort has never particularly interested me. And he goes on in a longer quotation. Generally, black people do not struggle with raci racism. It's just a given. We combat it when possible. We accept it when we can't. Those are our choices and always have been. Identity is basically a synonym for category. And while categories make language possible, they make problems in life, especially when you try to assign them or try to assign subjects to them. People almost never fit or never fit for long. Unlike Le Guin, who acknowledges an early shyness uh, gradually eroded by her own journey through second wave feminism, and what I mean uh, there is that she used to deny the label queer for her characters like, um, like Estraven, um, and later admitted that, quote unquote, of course they were. So, unlike Le Guin in this, Delaney was never tentative about matters of sex, gender, and race. From his The Einstein Intersection, 1967, 
to Triton in 1976, to Stars in My Pocket Like Grains of Sand, 1984, to mention only a few that expl explicitly address gender. Delaney unsettles readers' expectations with his aliens' polymorphous bodies and perverse forms of sexuality and desire. While Le Guin, as I mentioned, self-deprecatingly admits to her one-time reluctance to describe a character like Estraven as queer, Delaney, uh, whose writing also includes frank and brilliant autobiographical essays on his own queer life, brooked no su such compunction. Often called the first African-American science fiction writer, Delaney would insist on adding the word queer to that label, the first queer African-American science fiction writer. He remained profoundly interested particularly in, quote, the rhetoric of sex and the discourse of desire, as well as race. In that context, he actually does cite with approval the work of both Ursula Le Guin and, often, and also uh, Toni Morrison, whom I'll discuss later. What may best distinguish Delaney's work from Le Guin's and brings him closer, in fact, to somebody like Octavia Butler is his identification of power as inextricably linked to sexual desire. This darker and more dangerous tale that is of power and, sexu and sex, sexuality, weaves itself through so many of his stories, shape shifts his characters, sharpens his, st his style of realism. This is a quote. Power is what distinguishes the psychic discourse of desire from the social rhetoric of sex. Desire, to the extent that it's a material and social discourse, commands power enough to found and destroy cities. The power is so great that when caught in an actual rhetorical manifestation of desire, a particular sex act, say, it is sometimes all but impossible to untangle the complex webs of power that shoot through it from various directions, the power relations that are the act and that constitute it." End quote. And indeed, the vast plethora of worlds and communications among his narratives are needed, as in his novel, Stars in My Pocket, to frame the uncontainable, to voice the unspeakable, which is a word he actually uses as a, a title of one of his autobiographical essays. It's impossible to overemphasize the radical imaginations of these two figures, that is Le Guin and Delaney, but the latter in particular, for whom the experience of the gender queer was not merely speculation. The scale of his imagined words, worlds are as expansive as any post-war post -war writers. The queer realism of his vision is matched today only by the likes of China Mieville and the American N.K. Jemison. Delaney, as well as Donna Haraway, championed the work of Joanna Russ early on. Haraway's own cyborg manifesto singles out Russ's classic The Female Man from 1975 among the many stories that offer, quote, an elsewhere born out of the hard and sometimes joyful work of getting on together, end quote. Uh, in groups that, quote, Melanesians perhaps more presciently call individuals rather than individuals. Russ's female man is a splintered entity of individual epigenetic versions of the author herself. So that is Joanna, the author, is a character in her own book. Uh, but then there are three more J's. There's Janine, Janet, and Jail. This splintering is the narratological strategy of tension informing the text's characterization of several different temporal planes um, out of an infinite number of possible universes or historical branches uh, that create uh, a new universe. So there's the, the sort of science behind the novel uh, imagines there to be um, many simultaneous possible um, universes at, um, at the same time, <laughs> simultaneously, yeah. The, this, this structural device allows for just the kind of literary experimentation that made Russ a blast of fresh air in the male-dominated uh, realm of American um, science fiction. 
The reader, like the so-called four J's, that splintered character, is transported to each of these possible worlds. Um, and that includes one past world, our present, and two different futures. Janet's world is, it takes place a thousand years from now, uh, and it's called While Away. It's an all-female utopia. Um, men were killed off um, by a uh, virus, and, and then finally um, by war. And While Away uh, is um, highly intelligent, technologically advanced, extremely workful, largely peaceful, and supported by a kinship web that is flexible but constant. The Wileyan citizen is characterized by independence, skepticism, but also dissatisfaction, as well as an, quote, eternal optimism. And this is a further quote. Wileyans cannot forget that early paradise of their freely indulgent childhoods. And every new face, every new day, every smoke, every dance, every uh, brings back life's possibilities. Also, sleep and eating, sunrise, weather, the seasons, machinery, gossip, and the eternal temptations of art, end quote. Wildway celebrates, above all, pleasure. Jail's world is even further into the future, and it evolves having never given up the battle of the sexes, for which Jail is in fact recruiting her earlier epigen uh, epigenetic selves as warriors. Sexual pleasure seems closely associated with power. Jail herself is bio-enhanced. Uh, her world's advanced technology uh, only, or sorry, uh, still uh, centering on maintaining dominance in a world where women rule um, and many men are simply vacuous boy toys. In this world, the dualistic us and them habit of thinking and, and acting remains. As Jail lists the long histories of wars and, and conflicts, she concludes that humanity has, quote, only, only one war left. When I say, this is jail, them and us, I mean, of course, the haves and the have-nots, the two sides. There are always two sides, aren't there? I mean the men and the women, or the manlanders and the womanlanders. That said, Jail's world does, does include a percentage of males who at puberty don't become, quote unquote, real men. There's a hyphen in between those two words. There are the changed uh, with surgery, increasingly called the cunts in popular slang, so trans, uh, trans women. And there are the half changed, quote, artists, illusionists, impressionists of femininity who keep their genitals, but who grow slim, grow languid, grow emotional and feminine, all this the effect of spirit only. Jail's war, that character claims, is brewing in reaction to Manland's fear and growing contempt of, quote, us real women, end quote. And this is a longer quotation. They let us do our thinking for them. They even let us do our feeling, their feeling for them. They're riddled with duality and the fear of duality. And the fear of themselves. I think it's in their blood. What human being would, sweating with rage and sweat, uh, mark out two equally revolting paths and insist that her fellow creatures tread one uh, or the other. Ah, the rivalries of cosmic he-men and the worlds they must conquer and the terrors they must face and the rivals they must challenge and overcome." End quote. Jail sounds here like Zua from Gertrude Short's story, except that Jail's response to a manlander boss whose misogynist rants become uh, increasingly unhinged and violent is literally to rip him to shreds with surgically enhanced metallic clawed fingers, leaving him, quote, a plunging fountain to the ground, end quote. After this display, only Janine signs on to have Jail travel back to her historical plane and kill off all the men. 
Janina was the weakest of the four J's, the least independent, um, and um, therefore is uh, um, radicalized first. Right? Oh, sure, says Janine, I don't mind. You can bring in all the soldiers you want. You can take the whole place over. I wish you would, end quote. But Janet, the citizen of the imperfect but good enough single-sex utopia of while away, demurs as this sort of blatant militarism has no place in her society, nor does she feel responsible for the fate of another world. In this way, Russ's novel draws back from the author's most radical intuitions, I think. Organized politically around her commitment to lesbian feminism, Russ approaches, but then pulls back from, the figures, figurations of sex and gender plasticity. The changed and the half-changed are introduced in Jail's world where technology can accomplish full sex transition surgically, but where Jail's own prosthetic alterations are weaponized. Neither the change nor the half change seem remotely political in their resistance to their originally assigned sex, and the change seems only to go one way, male to female. The character Joanna soldiers on in her own way. She writes this book, sends it out into the world with the traditional words of the literary envoy, quote, go little book, end quote in search of its audience wherever in the future it is to be found. Donna Haraway recognizes Russ's description of gender as a technology with political aesthetic and onto-epistemic modalities working in, on, and through the world. Um, this is a quote from Haraway. This book, The Female Man, made gender a patent scandal of the imagination. The intellect, nature, language, and history all those hoary categories in the romances of modernity. The linguistic and genetic mis miscegenation of both Russ's female man and my, meaning Haraway's, female man, the little copyright sign, is a tool for provoking a little technical and political intercourse or criminal conversation or reproductive commerce about what counts as nature, for whom, and at what cost. End quote. So Jail's collection of the four J's is a strategy of tension, of reckoning with binary constructions of gender, though uh, importantly, each of the J's makes her own decision in the end. One commentator, the Spanish cultural philosopher Paul Preciado, has argued that in the 1970s, feminist success in, quote, writing a political history of the technological appropriation of women's bodies, end quote, and in explaining that the female body is, quote, the product of not just natural, but also political history, end quote, is, he says, without a doubt, one of the greatest epistemological ruptures of the 20th century, end quote. At the same time, however, Preciado's countersexual critique, and that's his word from the countersexual manifesto, uh, the um, countersexual critique of second wave feminism submits that an under-theorized and negative view of technology ironically affirms an essentialist, quote, conflation of women's bodies and sexuality with the reproductive function, end quote. Technology remains demonized as a patriarchal tool of oppression, unable, adds Preciado, quote, to imagine dissident uses of technology and queering of techniques as a possible political strategy by which to resist domination. This charge rings true, I think, even in the case of the classic, uh, uh, the classic text, uh, Marge Piercy's Women on the Edge of Time from 1976, which portrays the utopian possibility of community in diversity supported by an ethos of unconditional care. Located in the year 2137, in what had been the Eastern United States, Mattapoisett cultivates a diverse, sustainable, and internally peaceful community by rejecting capitalist neoliberalism 
of its past, that is, of our own time. The, pro the protagonist from the present world is Connie, a poor Hispanic woman who has been in and out of treatment for drug abuse and mental health issues. Her weak grip on self-control and apparently on sanity appears to be why she is able to receive Luciente, the visitor from the future who is seeking to connect with, any, with anyone in what she calls this crux time that is in Connie's uh, historical moment. In a, an historical inflection point at which, Luciente says, alternative universes exist, probabilities clash, and possibilities wink out forever. As she visits the future, Connie begins articulating her own grievances against the inequalities of social power. Quote, the closest I ever came to somebody with real power was when I was standing there in front of a judge who sentenced me. The people I've hated, the power they have, is just power over me. Big deal, some power, caseworkers, pimps, social workers, end quote. When Connie's lead psychiatrist implants a dialetrode or plug for experimental treatment, Connie understands that, quote, she was the experiment. They would rape her body, her brain, herself. Cold, calculating, ambitious, believing themselves rational and superior, they chased the crouching female animal through the brain with a scalpel. She would be a walking monster. Uh, a byproduct of natural and political history indeed. And actually some of her friends in the institution uh, start calling her monster from that point forward. Mattapoisett is, is working to break the link between natural and the technological by delinking the birthing and nurturance of infants from the male body, sorry, from the female body. Fetuses develop in mechanical brooders and parenting is shared. And here's a longer passage. It was part of women's long revolution when we were breaking all the old hierarchies. <clears throat> there finally, there was that one thing we had to give up to, the only power we ever had in return for no more power for anyone. The original production, the power to give birth. Because as long as we were bi biologically enchained, we'd never be equal and males would be humanized to be loving and tender. So we all became mothers. Every child has three to break the nuclear bonding." End quote. Matt Poisett is moving toward a gender liberated but hardly sexless community of chosen families, a gender liberation prompting morphological shifts in the human body, uh, specifically males capable of breastfeeding as well as linguistic shifts uh, to un ungendered pronouns and nouns. Connie is initially at first disgusted at the idea of a non-biological motherhood and, quote, the bland, bottle-born monsters of the future, born without pain, multicolored like a litter of puppies, end quote. But also, she does acknowledge silently, quote, without the stigmata of race and sex, end quote. It takes time for Connie to hear Luciente's proposal that, quote, dignity comes from work, uh, rather than from, quote, living under a code where a woman uh, never did anything like that, that is uh, valuable work, and, quote, that the, the myth of romance, sex, birth, children, isn't women's business anymore. It's everybody's. End quote. Such that care work is as valuable as any other enterprise, and no one is restricted from any work that they have a talent for. And here's a, a quote from um, one of their uh, historians. Our history isn't a set of axioms, Bolivar spoke firmly. I guess I see the original division of labor, that first dichotomy, as enabling later divvies into haves and haves and have nots, powerful and powerless enjoyers and workers, rapists and victims. The patriarchal mind-body split turned the body to machine and the rest of the universe into booty on which the will could run rampant, using, discarding, destroying." End quote. The biological categories of male and female are, quote, not useful, end quote, in Mattapoisett. And in Marge Piercy's later novel, He, She, and It, 
Neither are the categories of human and non-human, as love and desire come to be shared between robot and human, though again, uh, between male and female versions of both species. Of course, this has become a trope, that is, human, robot, or artificial intelligence love, that has been exploited not only in literature, and I, I think to uh, Jeanette Winterson's The Stone Gods, which includes a spaceship crew member named Spike, who is a robo-sapiens, a product of the co-evolution of artificial intelligence bots and homo sapiens sapiens. Spike is genderless, but presumed by the human neural normals um, who are in her company to be female and desired as such. But she makes the same statement that um, gender is useless. Mattapoisett's utopia is threatened, as in the female man, by an alternate and concurrent future in which their social revolution never took place. Social geography is organized according to wealth, from duds to middle levels, who never leave the polluted surface of what was once Manhattan. Uh, so from them to the so-called richies living and working on space platforms. Society is ruled by family clans or multis, quote, same as in your time, the Rock Mellons, the Morgan Fords, the Duke Ponts, unquote. The underclasses are kept doped up by easily available drugs. Males and females are reduced to cartoons of brutish masculinity and passive, over-sexualized femininity. And the multis are at war with each other and with Mattapoisett as well. As in the rest novel, Luciente has traveled back in time to locate the crux time when the course of history might have been able to be changed. The, gentle, the gentler, liberating aspirations of Matt Poisset, however strange for someone like Connie, who regards herself as, quote, human garbage, unquote, uh, these aspirations eventually win Connie over. And she's shocked to one day hear herself call the Matt Poisset folk her family. Quote, she felt a strange shifting as if her internal earth had quaked. What did she mean by calling them family? Well, something warm, end quote. When the psychic connection between Connie and Luciente is threatened by the mental institution's implantation of the dialetrode for experimental mind control therapy, Connie's war against institutionalization dovetails the Mattapoisett war. We're all at war, comments a Mattapoisett family member, B. Quote, you're a prisoner of war. May you free yourself. And Connie adds, but you're still fighting it. It isn't over yet, end quote, which elicits Luciente's core com communitarian and ecological vision. Quote, someday the gross repair will be done. The oceans will be balanced. The rivers flow clean. The wetlands and forests flourish. There'll be no more enemies. Know them and us. I can't know that time. We can only know what we truly imagine." End quote. Connie is yanked back to the real world, but, quote, she did know something new. The war raged outside her body now, outside her skull, but the enemy would press on and, viol and violate her frontiers again as soon as they chose their next advance. She was at war. War, she thought. I'm at war. No more fantasies. No more hopes. War. End quote. Thank you.